Historically, fishing has been a fun and beneficial way to pass the time. We use it to feed our families, we use it to relax, and sometimes we just use it for fun. But fishing can be incredibly dangerous, too. Spending time out on the lake or near a river can put you at a lot of risk. Over the years, weather and animal attacks have posed problems for people who embrace this hobby, but then there's another risk. The risk of running into a criminal. My name is Brian, and I'm the host and creator of Among the Dirt and Trees, a show where we explore true crime cases that occur out in nature. In this episode, we're going to discuss two stories about two little boys who went missing back in 1910 while they were out fishing with their friends. They were never seen again, and many people believe that the same villain is to blame. I've watched enough shows like I Shouldn't Be Alive to know that people can really get into trouble while they're out fishing. There is the risk of flash floods, the risk of injury, and of course, the risk of bad tan lines. Personally, I have only been fishing once, but I actually think that my experience is fairly telling. At the age of seven, I went fishing with my father, which puts me right at the age of our youngest victim. When we went out, it was not a fancy experience. As far as I know, that was the last time that my dad went fishing as well, which shows you about how much I know about it. But I wanted to go, and he decided to indulge me. Unfortunately, this story is also one of those family stories that just kind of lingers and has haunted me ever since. I'm sure you'll see why. Out on the lake, I was ready. As a kid, I had an obsession with outdoors preparedness. It went so far that my favorite board game was the worst case scenario survival game growing up. I used to know how to survive everything that could kill you out in nature, which is extra funny now for reasons that I'm sure you can all understand. <laughs> anyway, there I was out on this lake. I had my pole. I had my little water shoes. I was standing in the water. I was ready. The only problem was that these stupid fish kept stealing my bait, a fact which no one prepared me for. So I'm standing there. I'm bored. It's hot out. The fish are just playing mind games with me at this point, and that is when it happens. Out of nowhere, this catfish, which I no doubt very accurately recall being about 15 feet in length, leaps out of the water near me with pure murder in its eyes. I screamed. I ran back to the shore. <laughs> I did not go back in the water, and I did not go fishing again. Now, before you assume that I am a complete chicken, I would just like to let you know that I actually believe that this was my survival instincts kicking in full force, because I later learned that I am, in fact, deathly allergic to fish. So, the fish really did try to kill me, whether it knows it or not. The important part of this story is that kids are not always prepared for the dangers and frights that can come with time spent outside. 89 years before the great fish trauma of my life, nine-year-old Edward Paul Adams went out fishing with his friends. It was a nice day out, and they wanted to pass the time catching some fish in a local nature area. And for a while, they were having a lot of fun. Unfortunately, the tone of the day changed when some older boys from nearby showed up and started to hassle them. Apparently, one of the older boys thought it would be funny to try to scare the younger boys out of their fishing spot. So the older boy claimed that his father was a local game warden. In case you are not outdoorsy, or you have never watched Northwood's Law, which is basically a show about people paying a lot of fines for illegally killing animals and making temporary homes in very weird places, a game warden is a trusted conservation officer that is responsible for protecting natural resources, plants, and wildlife in an area. Basically, they are nature cops who make sure that people aren't horrible when they go play outside. So this kid sits down tells the younger boys that if they keep fishing, 
where they are, he is going to have them all arrested for fishing without a license. Me being who I am, I really wanted to know how much of a punk this kid was. So I did a little research for your general knowledge. First, fish wardens weren't even allowed to arrest anyone in Pennsylvania until 1915. So that kid wasn't even making a good threat, which I think is just even more rude. In addition to this, fishing licenses weren't actually required until 1919, and that was only for non-residents. That first year, only 50 of those licenses were even sold, so I'm pretty sure most people just went out without them and still did not get arrested for it. And finally, residents, which these kids no doubt were, weren't required to have a fishing license until 1922. So, I think we can just all agree that this older kid was just a jerk and probably should have read some fishing laws. But after hassling the kids, the older boys finally gave up. The younger ones weren't giving up their spot for anything, so the older ones headed off to go find somewhere else to go. On their way out of the forest, the older boy claimed that he saw a wild man hiding in a nearby bush. Suddenly interested in not being a total nightmare, he went to tell the younger boys, you know, because he cared about them. Unfortunately, since he had already been lying, and poorly at that, the younger boys, including Edward, simply brushed him off. They didn't care. Apparently there really is merit to the whole boy who cried wolf story, even if he tries to shake it up and cry wild man instead. But... The older boy tried to convince them, and the kids just were not having it. At least not until they heard the wild man out in the woods. Then, they all went sprinting off while this strange man cursed at them and chased them down. While they were running, Edward Adams was left behind, and when they went back to look for him, he was gone. Now, the kids told Edward's parents, but the police never found him or any traces of a mysterious wild man. For me, this whole story reads like a cautionary tale. I'm guessing that the older boy never lied again after he realized that a little boy disappeared because of his crappy games. At least I hope that's the case, but kids are jerks. Overall, it just, it sounds a a lot like a a Stephen King novel to me. Like, something bad happens to a little boy when he and his friends are doing something that they don't want to get in trouble for, and they all make up a story about what happened, and then suddenly you get these kids saying, oh, there's a wild man, you know? The second I read that, it just kind of had me raising my eyebrows. Like, what really happened, you know? But every part of this case just kind of sounds really fictional to me. Um, despite that, there's just no disputing the fact that a young boy disappeared that day and no one knows what happened. So when all this went down, it was no secret in town that Edward had gone missing. A kid goes missing in a small town and people notice. And apparently a lot of people went out to look for him. The neighborhood rallied and conducted a search. They didn't find anything, but two weeks and a day later, someone attached a ransom note demanding $10,000 for a young boy. The only problem was that there was nothing else on the note. No further instructions showed up and nothing ever came of it. Police don't even know if it was real or a prank. What they did know was that Edward was gone, and ultimately he was never seen again. Remember how, when I was seven, I was running away from fish? Well, Michael Stefan was a much braver kid than I was. And on April 16th, 1910, the very same day that Edward went missing, Michael was out with an older friend. They were fishing at a nearby creek and periodically moving along it, trying to find fish. When you're fishing out in this kind of environment, you have to space yourself out, you know? So... Michael's older friend was moving ahead of him. 
but reports do say that he would continuously come back and check on Michael from time to time and just make sure that he was still cool. One of the times when he went to check on Michael, he noticed that he was gone. At the time, he didn't really think anything of it. He just assumed that Michael went home, so he went to check on him, make sure that he got there all right, see if he had caught more fish than him, you know, normal stuff. But when he arrived, he was informed that Michael had not returned from their fishing trip and no one had seen him since he left. The police were notified and a search began. Something that I read about this story that I really loved was the fact that when the search parties were formed, employees from Michael's father's job were actually allowed to leave work early for the day to join in the search for the boys. So this added hundreds of extra people to the search, which I'm sure was a really big deal at the time. I have to kind of assume that there wasn't an easy way to organize a lot of people, but they had all these people in one location. They spread the news and everybody went out to do it. Unfortunately, despite their efforts, neither of the two boys were ever found. Everything of that I found about these cases basically just stated that there was nothing but dead ends. There was no real evidence. There was no follow-up. There was just nothing. These little boys literally just disappeared into thin air. The general consensus was that the two crimes were linked. And to some extent, it makes sense. You know, two young boys go missing under similar circumstances in a somewhat similar area. It's definitely a bit of a coincidence, probably more now or more then, you know, than it would be now. But overall, this theory just kind of feels a little strange to me. Cars were really new at this point in history. So it wasn't like most people were quickly traveling at a high amount of speed, especially considering most of them would have been on foot. 13 miles, well, it's certainly not impossible or anything, is still a pretty big span of space. You know, it's, it's a lot to cover. With that being said, cars did actually exist, and apparently... The mere introduction of vehicles was directly correlated with an increase in child kidnappings. So, it's not the most impossible theory. The most obvious theory is the one with the wild man, but that doesn't seem like a plausible story, especially if the man was supposed to be responsible for snatching up both of these kids. It seems pretty unlikely that this wild man could have run a full 13 miles and abducted both little boys without issue, without a trace. And considering the fact that they never found their bodies, it it stands to reason that the boys were either murdered and buried very quickly or just kidnapped completely. Overall, it just seems weird to me that someone would just go running through fishing spots looking for little kids to grab. That doesn't mean that it's impossible, and I'm sure at that point in time it was a pretty good place to go looking if you were trying to abduct a child, but... The connection between the two seems like a bit of a stretch. As the true crime community knows, some people just aren't right. So for all we know, there was some Olympic track athlete wild man scooping up kids. But when you think of little kids going missing out in nature, it seems likely that natural factors should be considered. With a little research, I learned that Pennsylvania has plenty of animals that could harm an adult, much less a young kid. There are wildcats, bears, venomous snakes, and coyotes, all of which could have grabbed either of these kids, but it still doesn't explain the lack of bodies or evidence or anything. Given the size of the search parties, it seems likely that they covered a really large area looking for these little boys. And obviously, we all know search parties miss things. That's a fairly common occurrence, but 
if you were to send out that many people and there are two little boys who disappeared under any kind of somewhat natural circumstance, it seems pretty unlikely that somebody would not have found them. Some animal would have left some trace or something. But we will actually never know. They never found anything else. So these cases were never solved and they have actually only repeatedly been brought up over the years due to the disappearance of Marjorie West, who is a four-year-old girl who vanished from a nearby forest in a similar Pennsylvania area 28 years later. It surprises me that so many people think that these cases are linked, but it definitely has some jeepers, creepers, it feeds every 23 years energy that just kind of really freaked me out while I was reading about it. So if you want to hear about Marjorie's disappearance and all the chaos that came with it, tune in for the next episode. Her case received some fairly extensive coverage and has quite a few twists and turns. As always, if you want access to more true crime content or to talk about kids disappearing under weird circumstances, feel free to check me out on Twitter or Instagram using the tag at DabPod. And if you would like access to ad-free episodes and our community Discord, head on over to become a patron at patreon.com slash like and inscribe. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.